So yeah, so I'm Paul Doherty and I've got the role of Chief Technology Officer of Accenture and what we do is help large enterprise companies and small companies use, tech, you know, use technology to transform their businesses. And the, the last discussion was a perfect tee up for what I want to talk about because uh, the key issue that I'd like to you know, share with you and uh, get you thinking about is some new thinking that we're doing on what the future of work looks like and what the future of business looks like in an AI, uh, in an AI driven world. So we, I titled the talk AI, the missing middle in the future of work. And the new concept that I'm going to share with you is this idea around the missing middle that we've been uh, exploring in Accenture and the work that we've been doing, which we think is part of the answer, not the whole answer, but part of the answer to what Hillary and Andy were just talking about is where will the jobs come from and where will the good jobs come from as we look at this, you know, the technology revolution that we're in the midst of. Uh, you know, this comes by, you know, the work we're doing comes by way of doing a lot of work in AI for clients. I've been doing work in uh, technology around uh, companies for, for over 30 years. And if looking back at any trend before, whether it be client server or distributed computing, internet, cloud computing, nothing has moved as fast as AI is moving right now in the enterprise. Uh, we're doing hundreds of projects, approaching, the, approaching thousands of projects in artificial intelligence, real interesting work for companies that are using AI to transform their businesses and do interesting things. This is moving far faster than, uh, than anything I've seen before that we've looked at in our business. And so this issue of, you know, on the one hand, we're very optimistic, as Andy said, this is gonna solve a lot of problems for us. Uh, we've done research where we believe that AI uh, has the potential to add $8 trillion to the US economy in about 20 years as it builds and grows, which would be a significant increase in the GDP growth rate in the US. It could add about a trillion and a half to the German economy. Uh, and when you look at macro statistics and the way you, know, the way you can break it down, However, that, that's exciting and you can solve great healthcare problems, you can solve great uh, uh, problems around sustainability, food supply, agriculture, but you're left with the issue of what's happening with jobs and what's happening to people. And that's what I'll dive into a little bit here. And the, uh, the backdrop of this all is the, the amazing, t you know, amazing advances in technology that we're seeing and the things that artificial intelligence and technologies powered by artificial intelligence are allowing us to do. So you know all these things on the screen. I won't spend a lot of time explaining them, but it's uh, robotics, artificial intelligence, blockchain, virtual agents, uh, robotics, uh, drones, many things that are, that are really transforming the way that businesses can conduct their work. And a lot of these things, all these things really, are powered to some degree by artificial intelligence. And we're still at the early stage of the innovation that's being driven with all this. I happened to be in uh, China last week visiting Shenzhen and Hangzhou, and the degree of improvements and new innovations in robotics, humanoid robotics, new technologies that are being applied, artificial general intelligence, and very interesting things that are coming out is, uh, is staggering. And that's, uh, so, so while we have amazing technologies to deal with today, this, the pace of advance is really staggering, which leads to a challenge for businesses of what do you do when you think about your business and how to adopt these technologies to transform your business. And one of the things that, uh, that we believe that we're doing some work on right now is we believe we're at one of those points that happens once a generation where businesses need to change the way that they approach their business and rethink you know, the enterprise and their organization. And so we're, we're, we're talking about this idea of moving from assembly line to assemblage. You heard Andy talk about assembly line a few minutes ago. And the concept here is that we believe we're in a third generation of work. Uh, to think about it, a third generation of work. The first generation of work was the assembly lines. The first real time we tried to do scientific management, Henry Ford assembled, you know, built assembly lines, very structured work, people di distant from machines, and the work, again, very sequential, structured, and organized. The second generation of work, I'd argue, happened in the 80s and 90s with the re-engineering of work based on the first generation of information technology that we applied. So you could create knowledge work as an applied technology in a different way. And we had things like re-engineering that we applied to really change the way that work was done. But it was still the person a little bit distant from the technology. And we believe what's happening now is we're entering a third generation of the way that we need to think about work, which is not not thinking about technology and people separately, but, but thinking about technology and people together. And that's what we mean by the assemblage. And I'll give you some e examples of that. And we believe it also blows up the whole notion of how you think about structuring your business and blows up the whole notion of what you think about as a business process and requires you to think about your business in a fundamentally different way, which is what I'll, uh, what I'll explain here. 
And uh, so if you accept that idea of the third generation of work that's happening here, the, the big thing that we think is happening and why we're so, you know, having these discussions around jobs is that there's a missing element from the discussion around jobs right now. And we call it the missing middle. So typically when I'm involved in discussions or I'm reading articles about what's happening with jobs, you hear on the one hand, you hear about the machine oriented skills. You hear about the, the, what machines are used to do, which is uh, they're used to transact, they're used to iterate, they're used to predict, they're used to do things repetitively in a process way. That's the machine over there. On the human side, you have creativity, uh, you have uh, the ability to improvise, you have leadership, change, emotion, things like that. Very distinct. A lot of the discussions and surveys you read about what's, what's going to happen with jobs is the two get inter inter interposed and you look at how you know, machines are going to take over for humans. We believe that most of the jobs are going to come from the middle, which is these assemblages of people and machines working together in a different way. And that's why we're talking about this idea of the missing middle. And we think there's two big categories of jobs that we're not talking about enough in the middle right now. One category of jobs is where uh, humans help machines. And another category of jobs is where machines help humans. Where humans help machines is where we see a, a lot of jobs being created already today at the early stages uh, in the areas of, we call it training, explaining, and sustaining AI and machine-based systems. So training in areas like uh, empathy trainers uh, and personality trainers for agent-based uh, AI systems that are being deployed. As a simple example, we're developing a system for a large airline that has a, it's going to have a human-based human agent the personality of that agent is very important because that will be the brand of the airline. So they have to think very carefully about the responses, the tone, the nature of that person, what it means. So who, who are going to be the personality trainers, the empathy trainers of the agents of the future as this scales? And that's a new type of skill that requires a very different type of person and a very different type of skill going forward. Explainers and sustainers, I won't go into in detail because of time, but there's similar categories of jobs that we don't think about today that are about explaining the way AI works, uh, AI algorithms work, and also sustainers who look at sustaining the impact and the productivity and the way that machines work uh, interacting with humans. So that's, that's people helping machines. Machines helping people we divide into categories that we call amplifying, interacting, and embodying. Amplifying being machines that help people do more in their current roles. A great example of this is Autodesk's Dreamcatcher if you're familiar with this, which takes an engineer or a designer and makes them far more effective and productive by using AI to generate thousands of product variations based on specs that the, designer, that the engineer or designer can create and not eliminating the designer or engineer, but helping the designer or engineer come to better outcomes through you know, the machine-generated assistance that they get. And that's one example. An example of the embodiment category of you know, machines and people working together is what's happening with Mercedes in their E-Class factory, you're probably guessing many of you have heard the story, with Mercedes in the E-Class factory, where they were 90% automated with robots, like the ones you saw on the prior slide. So again, 90% of the production automated using physical uh, robots. They've, they realized that in the era of more personalized automobiles, high degree of automation was, uh, was not helping the flexibility they needed in the business. So they reduced the level of automation to under 50%, introduced more humans and a different kind of robot that was more flexible to allow human-machine collaboration to produce the variety of automobile options and configurations that they needed in, in their factory going forward. So that's an example of what we mean by embodiment. And uh, again, uh, machines helping people and working together to do things differently. So we think this missing middle uh, offers the key to not solving the whole jobs issue that we talk about because there's, there are lots of jobs that will be impacted and eliminated uh, based on automation and AI and what's happening. But we believe that one of the problems is uh, leaders and organizations and businesses are thinking too, too much at the poles of the, of the issue with machine versus human and not enough in the middle about how do we create the roles of the future and change the business in a way uh, that's kind of human-centric in creating this type of opportunity. And we think as you look at that then, that there's three things that we're working with, uh, with companies on to help them get to this answer where we, where we address the missing middle and restructure companies in the right way, re-engineer companies in the right way. The first step we talk about is reimagining business processes. 
And again, we think the, the era of, this, this, of, the hi, of the hierarchical organization and the sequential business process described by a flowchart, that's gone. And uh, we need to blow that up and instead move to more organic biological business processes that are defined in a very different way. And that's a big change for, organiza for the organization structure and a big change for the, the way processes are constructed. One way to think about it is, or one example to use to illustrate how you think about it, is General Electric and what they're doing with Predix in, the, in, the, in their aircraft business. The maintenance of the, aircraft, of the aircraft engines for GE used to be a sequential process, inspections, time-based, uh, extensive checklists to, that led to a fixed sequential schedule for maintenance of aircraft engines. With, uh, with what they're applying with Predix and the digital twin concept where they can digitally model an engine, applying AI, partnering with their engineers, Instead, they create a personalized maintenance inventory and schedule for each engine that's different and a process that's different and uh, maintenance procedures that are different to optimize the effectiveness of that engine and, and the, uh, the aircraft that it's on. Completely different process, not sequential, event-driven based on you know, real-time input and stimulus you know, with the algorithm and the machine, the digital twin in this case, working with the engineer. And by the way, you still need an engineer who understands engines, who understands maintenance, to work with the technology to make this work, which is where the assemblage comes back in. And that's just one example of what we believe needs to happen uh, across the organization, up and down the organization, to restructure the way they do work to, uh, to meet the AI age. The second concept then is transforming the human-machine interface. And this is where we think there's a lot of interesting jobs, again, in the middle. And this is about how do you use new interfaces combined with artificial intelligence to allow people to do work in different ways. The example I'll give you here is uh, one from a large aircraft manufacturer, just happens to be aircraft industry again, although a very different company. And uh, they had an issue with uh, not enough skilled workers to do some of their assembly. Uh, so what, what, uh, what that company did is they used mixed reality headsets with machine learning capability that could learn the best practice way of doing tasks across many assembly, uh, assembly technicians. Uh, combined with uh, laser-guided assembly techniques to help somebody learn the exact task they were doing more effectively so that uh, a worker could more rapidly advance their skills, they could learn faster, accelerate their career more rapidly, and the company got better quality, better productivity, et cetera, out of it. So again, it didn't replace the worker, augmented the worker, allowed them to work more effectively and work at best practice across a, a broad pool of, of workers. And again, we see you know, many, many opportunities to apply this as you look at restructuring the work that, that uh, enterprises do. And finally, one of the biggest opportunities we see is the opportunity but to, to what we call is, uh, to do what we call uh, lighting up the dark data. How do you use the latent data that organizations have to um, you know, dramatically change uh, the way they do, the, they do their uh, business processes and get, more, and get uh, new value? One of the examples here that I, that I like to use is uh, what we're seeing in, in urban farming, new, new approaches to agriculture that are very uh, tech-driven, very AI-driven, like Aero Farms and other organizations that are using Im images with uh, uh, machine vision and, re and recognition combined with sensors and uh, a lot of algorithms to really understand how you optimize a growing process in urban farming, in environments where you optimize around, uh, optimize around uh, things like uh, the uh, reuse of water and sustainability factors, the you know, reducing the consumption of electricity and also producing the best possible produce you can. And there's tremendous advances there that are being driven by being able to use this data that you just couldn't process and analyze before. So those are the ideas, reimagining the business process, uh, transforming the way that humans and machines work, and then lighting up the dark data to really get at re restructuring the company and enabling this new category of jobs that we see in the, in the middle of this debate between people and machines. Just a couple other things uh, to, to end on, and then I'm going to invite David up on stage to, to chat a little bit. One thing we believe is, is really important from the research we did and from this, the belief we have about how to apply technology is that we're in an age where uh, responsibly applying AI is very important. And we heard two presentations ago, if you were in the room, about the importance of, of a different view of leaders working in their communities uh, with, a, with a new degree of responsibility. And we firmly believe in that and also believe that business leaders and organization leaders have a responsibility to apply AI in the right way um, as uh, consistent with what I was just talking about. But these, there's also um, some new principles that are more important to deal with 
in uh, the, the new era going forward than it, they have been before. So there's five principles we talk about that we're building into you know, the, way we, uh, the way we work with organizations and uh, the way we develop these solutions. One of them is accountability. So there's a big debate about you know, should machines be able to, you know, what decisions should machines be able to do? What should an autonomous vehicle be able to do? And the reality is that those are human decisions, not machine decisions. Machines aren't making decisions. Humans are making decisions that allow machines to make decisions. So it's, very, it's critically important for leaders in organizations as they're designing this new business to really take accountability and really carefully decide where hu machines can make decisions autonomously and where you need humans in the loop. And that's a, a decision within a, you know, our control as humans and leaders. Transparency, we believe, is critical. Uh, there's some AI algorithms that aren't explainable. So there's ways to, ex to apply AI where you don't know why the result came out. But there's also processes that exist that need to be explainable. And it's unacceptable to apply an unexplainable technique to something that needs to be explained. The example I'll use is an article that appeared earlier this week about certain jurisdictions in the US that are using black box AI algorithms to produce sentencing guidelines for, uh, for judges. And uh, should you have black box sentencing guidelines that you can't explain setting sentencing you know, guidelines for judges? I'd argue that's a good debate to have on transparency and whether you should be using that type of technology. Because that's probably a process where you have an obligation to explain how you came to the answer. Honesty is a principle where we believe that AI and the way companies and organizations use it shouldn't be used to game the system. One of the simplest things to do in the world would be to design your autonomous vehicle to avoid detection and uh, break the speed limits you know, wherever it wasn't, uh, where it wasn't being detected. That wouldn't be the right thing to do. It would be an easy thing to do. So designing for honesty is, is going to be really important for organizations, which gets into ethics and other things. And finally, we believe in organizations have an obligation to fairness at a higher standard than they have before. There's lots of examples about this. There was articles written about the discrimination inherent in some of the you know, Airbnb selection as one example. Any data set and any algorithm will be trained with a discriminatory bias. The question is how can you use technology to minimize the degree of discrimination so that we're not forward propagating biases from the data sets and algorithms of today into the way we're designing systems of tomorrow. And I believe it's possible to get to design algorithms to take out some of the, the factors that lead to discrimination and, uh, and design for more fairness going forward. And that's again a, a leadership responsibility. And finally, we talk about human-centric, which is this idea of designing for the middle and the jobs in the middle as organizations look at the, designing their new AI-enabled and tech-enabled organizations of the future in this, in this third generation of work that we see coming. So, uh, and then finally, I'll just uh, stop here and then invite David up. The final idea here that a couple of the other sessions have talked about is what's our obligation to reinvest in the workforce? And uh, I believe, and we as an organization believe, that we have a big obligation to work together more than we have in the past uh, within uh, companies and across public and private sector organizations to look at how we prepare the workforce better. It's a hard problem to solve. Andy touched on it earlier. It's not easy, but we need to work better. You know, we need to do more work on reskilling uh, over a, over a, on a career basis for employees as well as you know, the K-12 uh, future talent supply pipeline that we focus a lot on. And uh, we believe that we in our organization, as an example, are taking a accountability for this. And one thing I'll give you as an example, we, in our own business, we automated a part of our business using AI that eliminated 500 jobs. I can't tell you the, exactly what it was, but we, we eliminated 500 jobs and we make, made a decision not to, not to release those 500 people. They were doing very basic claims processing type of work, very easily automated work. We instead, uh, uh, we uh, took, kept that group and we're, retraining them. We're using technology to figure out what their aptitude is and how we can retrain them into other jobs in the company as an experiment in how you can, you know, not just take the easy decision to release employees as you automate using technology, but how can you look at creating new opportunities for employees, again, in these middle sections of work. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll uh, take a breath and pause. I threw out a lot of ideas there, so David, it might be a good time to chat a little bit. Uh, okay. I think we're... We'll oh, back up. we got a little more time. Okay, yeah. cool. Uh, sit down. So if I were to summarize the session prior to this and what you just said, um, there's tremendous continuity between the two. And it seems to me the summary would be we're going to be doing a lot more stuff that we've never been able to do before, but the idea that we'll need fewer people to do it may be fundamentally wrong. And yet that is the prejudice that is very much abroad. 
Yeah, I, I just adjust that a little bit. I, I think the jury's still out on whether there's, uh, whether there's more jobs than less. I think, the, I think what, I, uh, what I disagree with is the polar estimates that are tossed out there about we're going you know, to lose 25 million jobs over the next several years in the U.S. as things get automated. I, I think those types of uh, extremes I, I don't believe will happen. There are certain categories of jobs that will be replaced quickly. It will, will be hard to... Uh, repurpose employees. We need to do different things to deal with those jobs. But I believe many, many of the jobs we're talking about that we're concerned about will be dealt with because some of this technology will roll out more slowly. And if we take the right approach to foc focusing on the people, I think we can mitigate the impacts. Yeah, of course. I think Andy was slightly more optimistic about it than you. But, yeah. uh, and he's often been interpreted as a real alarmist in Chicken Little, interestingly. So I think people misinterpret that uh, the book that, that he and Eric wrote somewhat. But, um, Okay, I mean, what you just said really, and, and the whole presentation, although you did touch on it at the end, raises very much this issue of, given all this, as society, what do we need to do to prepare? And um, give me your, you sort of touched on that, but educationally, policy-wise, what would you like to see happen that's not happening now in order to be able to move into this new kind of economy? Yeah, the biggest thing that I think, the biggest thing is probably the hardest thing, which is why, why it uh, requires a lot of focus, which is I think it's the mid-career reskilling is the biggest issue. So the, the jobs that'll be displaced where people have been, uh, they've been driving trucks or they're, they're, in second, uh, they're in second chance jobs already because their first job was automated. Uh, how do we deal with the, the right, the right skilling of those people for the jobs of the future? And that requires, that's different than the K through 12 issue. I'm actually more optimistic about K through 12 and building the future talent pipeline. So we've got a lot of focus there. I think the thing we need to focus on more, and we're trying to work with other companies and government organizations and NGOs, is how do we get more focus on, uh, on, this, on the, the mid-career people whose who's, uh, who's, who's jobs may be at risk if they're not prepared better. Well, it would seem those people are rather scared based on political developments worldwide. Well, yeah. it, it would, but we did, a, we did a project with the World Economic Forum. We did a survey, and this was a, a global survey. It was Western, you know, large Western economies. We did a very, very large survey across uh, uh, blue-collar worker through, through executive-level work, uh, workers. And uh, across that broad group, 90% of the people said that they were optimistic about how technology would impact their jobs. And uh, I'm sorry, 90% of them said they, were, they, wanted to learn, they wanted to learn more so they were ready for the impact technology would have on their jobs. And 75% of them said they were optimistic about their jobs. So, so that, that was surprising to us. People were more upbeat than we, ex than we expected. That, that was across the board. That section. optimism does not seem to be translating into political, it didn't didn't except didn't maybe in France. Um, but anyway, um, what about... Um, Another thing that I'm, with this job training issue, um, and Sefi so in her typical generous way mentioned Techonomy. Uh, we have a magazine, which you've been very involved in, uh, but we have a magazine coming out next week, and one of the articles is about the, the ongoing importance of the liberal arts. And there's several books out now that are very, very adamant that for all of the rhetoric about STEM, 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 and we need to learn to program and blah, 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 might be true, but if we throw the baby out with the bathwater, we're really going to be screwed. Do you view that, that we have to also be focusing on history, art, you know, the, the basic... A absolutely. Mankind's yeah. history, humankind's history, historical, cultural legacy? Yeah, I think, li I think liberal arts and other, uh, other uh, streams of education are critically important. If I had to make a prediction. You know, today, if you look at the job shortages today, we have 500,000 open IT jobs, technology jobs in the US is the number that we often cite. And that's true, we, we lack those jobs, we need more of a focus on... So setting step. programming is not a bad idea, right? Yeah, it's not a bad idea, but I would predict that if you look out six or seven years, we'd find that that shifted to these things I'm talking about in the middle, to people who, not, who understand a little bit of technology, but also understand a little bit about rhetoric and ethics and other things about how to apply technology, or, or designers that are in the fields of experience design, which are in demand now, but will be even in more demand as you think about the tremendous opportunity to you know, design more experiences around how people and machines work together. So I think the, the soft skills, I'd, I'd encourage people, kids to study everything from, uh, from uh, liberal arts to, um, to uh, you know, things like rhetoric to drama to other professions that are going to be, I think, in demand for these professions. So you, you agree with the idea that learning to think yeah. and have judgment is going to remain 
as if not more important in the future. Well, I think that's the, that's the fundamental human skill that, that we'll bring into this is judgment you know, through different lenses that, uh, that we can pull together with technology, you know, other technology literate skills. Okay. Yeah. The, the, we just have a little time left, but I wanted to go to one of the things you mentioned. You said you'd just been in China, and then you had that great slide with all the ethical things that need to happen, right? Mm -hmm. and, I, and you also told me as we were in the lobby that Alibaba and Baidu and Tencent and others in China are really rapidly investing in this just as Facebook, Google, and Amazon and others are doing. Somehow I'm not as confident that they will try to do it in the ways, I mean, I'm not so sure about Amazon, Facebook, and Google either, by the way, but how worried are you that, I mean, because honestly, a lot of these technologies are coming from a small number of giant companies whose interests are patently commercial. In the case of China, they are very different socio-politically in their orientation than we are. Are you confident and comfortable that we'll be able to abide by those sort of really good values as we move it, forward? Uh, yeah, I guess I'm opt optimistic in the sense that as, uh, as any of those platforms want to grow and scale globally, they have to deal with those types of issues. So they're not going to be successful if they, don't, if they don't create a platform that people trust to, to do business on. So I think that's... I, I think there'll be a self-governing mechanism on that to, to some extent. I think one of the issues that we do have to, to have to keep an eye on is there's a, there's kind of a bipolar thing that's going to happen with AI. I think, which is a lot of the concentration of talent and capability is going to be in the big platforms. If you look at you know, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and if you look in China, Alibaba, handful of other companies and what they're doing with with uh, artificial intelligence, they're investing and in moving at such a pace, and they have the the cloud computing and GPU enabled architectures to power it. That it's uh, it's very powerful. So on one hand, we have the power consolidating in platforms. On the other hand, I think those platforms enable a next generation of smaller businesses that will be able to use those platforms to compete with large enterprises. So I think we have a potential for a lot of entrepreneurial, entrepreneurs to flourish with new enterprises you know, based on AI and those platforms. But we may need conscious policies yeah. to encourage that outcome as opposed to a lot of other imaginable ones that might not be quite so pretty. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Well, I love that you're thinking about it this way, and I think the way you're talking about it is important for leaders to understand, because I don't think business leaders, and you, Accenture has great influence with them, really, either they're totally sanguine, or they're like Elon Musk, and they think we're gonna have self-driving cars in two years. Yeah. And frankly, I don't think many people who've been on the stage today seem to think that's too likely. Nope, exactly, and that's why I think, uh, I think it, business, the C-suite business executives, I think they're starting to understand the issues, but they tend to apply the technology in niches, and that's why this message of applying it more holistically to the company is important. Well, great. Yeah. Thank you good. so much, Paul. Okay, thanks, David. Really good. Yeah.